Nice. So what was the topic today? How's it going, Future Cannabis Project community? It's that rotten son of a blunt, Lobster Fam Farms. And uh, we have an interesting but very open-ended topic tonight. We might start with uh, choosing males, male selection, maybe a little stress testing on plants. and uh, But in general, it's kind of like a loose breeders panel, like uh, Peter was doing on uh, Clubhouse. So today we have Boston Bob zooming in from the West Coast, AK Beans Brains come, or from the East Coast, from Boston, obviously. We have Josh from in the Massachusetts area. And then AK Bean Brands coming in from Alaska. <clears throat> How's it going tonight, gentlemen? Thanks for being here. Going good. Thanks, Travis. Thanks. Going well. Right on. Uh, yeah, this is kind of like an open format, you know, nothing too strict on what to talk about. Um, me personally, I'm doing some of my first male selections ever. I've been uh, growing most of my adult life since about 2005. And uh, I've always been very passionate and curious about breeding, but never really delved into it. So I'm curious to hear what you guys like to look at in males, maybe. And I'm just going on smell right now. I was trying to observe any trichome development, which I haven't seen on any male plants yet. So I'm mostly just going on aroma and structure as like a crude start. And then I'll see what comes from the seeds. Yeah. Um that that's interesting that uh, i've i've talked a lot over the years you know about selections of plants for breeding um i started breeding in 97 98 and you know back then it was uh, i grew up in alabama and so it was more of um breeding to um just make sure i had seeds for the next year really than anything else because it was really difficult to get a hold of seed stock most everything was coming out of you know uh out of Europe and or if you're lucky you can get some stuff from Canada from um, you know cannabis culture uh, the Mark Emery um, stuff but anyhow um, this the past couple of years I've spent a significant amount of time um, working with males and selecting for males um, we're, it, it, I think it's more important to spend time with your males and, and stress test the males and looking at the traits in the males as it is I say more. It's equally as important, right, to look at your males as it is your females. A lot of times, people just like take a male, um, and from a from a, a pack, they might like the structure or something, or they'll do a little stem rub and and toss it in the tent uh, or in their garden or wherever they're making their seeds. And uh, you know that can work out okay, but uh, what I'm seeing is really devoting some time to making proper selections for the males. When it comes to pest resistance, mold, mildew, disease resistance, have a huge impact on the success of, of the work you're putting in. Um, so uh, you mentioned not seeing resin in males. Like that's a pretty rare trait from my experience. Um, when I was doing a lot of CBD breeding, we were growing out, you know, 250,000 plants at a time. And they would, uh, maybe we would find two or three males that exhibited the you know resin production trait um out of out of a quarter million seeds and i see about it's probably about the same for uh, type one thc dominant stuff too you don't see it all the time um and if you do it's uh it's it's pretty rare yeah that sounds very very rare i'm surprised my buddy was showing me some pictures that he went through a very small population and has it looks as resinous as a female. I mean, it's covered. Yeah. In resin, so it seems like he really just got the luck of the draw with that one. Well, I think too, a little bit now, it's like we've taken, you know, we like if you look at land race populations and then you look at genetics that have been worked for, you know, say a decade or, or for years, I think you're more likely to find males that exhibit that trait and stuff that's been worked harder stuff that's producing 30 percent you know 35 percent thc females i think that you might see that trait pop up more often than you do in like the cbd dominant stuff or in the um you know feral you know more heirloom land race varieties that those are those are extremely rare 
um, from what I've experienced. I don't know um, you guys may have seen, you know, that trait pop up more often. Um, I know you guys both have experience working a lot of, you know, heirloom varieties and been working with those plants for a long time. So yeah, I don't think I've ever seen uh, land race males that produce trichomes uh, out of the, I haven't grown like you uh, with just wide open uh, good numbers, but I, it's much more common in uh, it. You, you do see it in some heritage strains. I have a, a NL one that's from seed bank stock out of uh, out of about six of them that stayed in the backyard all summer and just like let them reveg. But after, as it got very mature, it did produce trichomes on it. So even uh, one in six on certain lines certainly could. Afghanis would be, I think, more prone to it. But when you see it, most strains, modern strains, I think it's due to uh, coming down from S1 breeding and some of that stuff's intersex showing. You'll see a calyx on it, a bract, actual bract, and uh, then you'll see the male uh, stamens or uh, whatever the parts there. I think they're called stamens. Once they come out, yeah. and then it'll actually be coming out of a smallish uh, calyx and uh, a true resin male that's male genetics only. I, I'd never see any female parts. You'll never see a pistol or a bract or calyx on those. So uh, there's varying degrees of the resin male. Some people that you're seeing the modern some modern ones would produce quite a bit more, but you'll see a bract on it also. So I would, I'd say it has a tendency uh, to come down from S1 lines, if, if you're seeing that. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Yeah. Yeah, on the most of the land race and the equatorials and that kind of stuff, it's very rare to see the, yes, you know, very see generate the trichomes on the. And my guess is is, uh, Travis, you said you saw some. My guess is they're probably indica-based strains, right? Yeah, he was a younger cat. I think he was mid twenties. Um, it was definitely a purplish strain. Like it, it was definitely something very modern. I can't remember exactly what, but sounds like kind of what you guys are saying. Yeah, I don't see him too often. I like the concept where it could be something akin to intersex issue. Maybe not a clear cut but just how it's crossing over where you might see a hair or a bract here and there on a male plant with the modern stuff. That's an interesting idea. I never thought of that. Uh, my friend up in Fairbanks, uh, Professor Frank, he does a ton of uh, male, he'll get them about two to three weeks in the flower and uh, really stress them hard, put them back into, into the full veg and then uh, really try to bring out any kind of pistols or feminine, you know, he really puts them through the ringer, but that's, it's common that uh, I'm seeing more uh, males now that are uh, herming than I ever see females that are herming. So I have no idea what's going on, especially in some Afghani strains. Uh, I've messed for two or three years with the black Afghan, and it still will put out about one in ten as a, a male herm. So it's crazy. I, I just threw a couple out on the just threw them out to the chicken just today just going through and we're like oh another another one popping its head right there so uh, an interesting point on bringing up the males is um epigenetics so epigenetics the dna stays the same but what's available and what can change through stress is it brings out certain traits or suppresses certain traits in the dna so what I found is if you're going to stress a male, which I like stressing the heck out of him, like, like similar to Frank, I got a, my process probably goes seven to nine months where I'm stressing out a male. Yeah. Really proving it there. Right. I mean, I'm, I'm going through the deal, but if you don't clone them first, you could take a stable male and then stress it out and then reveg it and then bring it back and put it in flour and you could take something that's been stable for everybody else, and that thing could produce herms because the stress is actually changing it. And if you, if you kind of look into the science of it, which is, you know, I'm kind of 50-50, but I, I think that the, the epigenetic levels that can change through stress are actually a heritable item. So I, I've only had two males that gave me any issues. And both of those were ones that got stressed 
by nature, not by me, and I hadn't cloned them first. And the ones that go through the stress process, I don't use. I use the original clone. And I think if somebody's not taking that clone and putting them through that stress process, they can actually change them. And I think it, it, it increases the chance of getting Hermes, right? Because, yeah. I mean, there's not... Does anybody know a plant that they can't herm? I mean, you can herm any of them, right? Yeah, I've, so. I've, I mean, in stress testing all of the different, you know, plants I've kept over the years, uh, I think you can, you know, you can definitely either let them get root bound enough or like stress or whatever. You can definitely, you know, make females flip and make males flip with, with stress. But the stress is a nice way to find the, the most sexually stable ones, right? But inherent in the plant is they all want to live, right? So if they get stressed bad enough, they're going to harm. So if we, when we're doing the stress testing and when people are trying to find a good male and they're willing to go through all the stress testing, if you've taken that clone first that hasn't been stressed, then you got a solid plant at the end of the testing and you go back to a plant that probably hasn't been changed at that next level down at that it's at that epigenetic genetic level so the key is for me if i could tell anybody doing anything looking for males is if you're going to start messing with them take a clone of the clean plant first keep that aside go through your testing and you know i mean i bring up the full flower i do everything but then i go back to the original you know unstressed male and i think you're going to have a better result by original unstressed male, Bob, do you mean the seedling? Like, would you take a cutting off the seed male and yep. run it through the ringer and just right. keep that as a backup? And then you have the, the seed plant itself at, for more donor material. If you wanted to flip that one, is that what you're saying? I am. So generally, I'm going to take that cut right around a month, right? So somewhere in the, I don't know, you know, eight nodes, seven, six, seven, eight nodes, maybe a but about a month in, I'm, I'm going to take the I'm going to take the top off probably, and and that's going to be my seedling or what I would call a clean male, and then I then I finish the process where I'm going through the rest of the stressing on it. But I'd like like Dave said on on what Frank does, I do the same thing. I mean I I I take them from a seven ounce cup to a solo cup to a one gallon, then then go to two or three i'll let them get right after i top them i'll let them get back to seven or eight you know or anywhere between five and eight nodes and then i put them in flower um, and the interesting part and, and i'd love to hear your guys comments one of the things that i found is some of the best males i have found were the last ones to show sex you know i yeah. started really digging the uh the last one i'll be thinking they're females that are just late females and surprisingly it'll be just a uh, an impressive late male the late ones uh, josh have you same thing for you or no yeah no yeah i've i've uh, matter of fact about i don't know it's probably been a seven or eight years ago i got to where i, I don't even fool usually with the the males that show first anymore like i noticed it so often that the males that that are the first to sex or the like you know ones that are if i'm outdoors like trying to drop pollen in mid-july you know like i'm those i don't i just chop them i don't even you know it, it's funny if, if i chop the first probably 20 percent that show i do the same thing yeah. they don't even make their as a funny analogy it, it's elk hunting right there's two big bulls on the top of the hill and there's a whole right. brood, and there's a whole brood of cows in the valley. And the young buck says, "Hey, let's run down there and get one." And the old guy says, "Hey, let's walk down and get them all." I mean, to me, that's the way I think the males go, right? Yeah, oh, yeah, you know. yeah. That's well, a that's yeah. a great analogy. Yeah. <laughs> the the yeah. cannabis wants to uh, always have that super male, which is, I in my opinion, reverting back to its wild hemp state. So, if you were to pick that male that super male five times in a row, you've basically driven it away from the drug side and went right back to not necessarily fiber side, but could be more uh, medicinal CBD or fiber, either one, but it goes back to its feral wild uh, 
ancestors pretty quick just by its own selection. So super males, they'll, I learned uh, 30 years ago that, you know, we picked first four or five generations of uh, seed bank stock and we just were so impressed on the ones, what we call the super males, you know, but after uh, third generation, we started to notice it fourth and fifth generation, we realized we had completely flipped it uh, to be not what you want. So um, it, it, it tells you an awful lot about male selection and uh, really picking that last one it's always going to be the uh the more medicinal or drug type yeah for my end i'm do, i'm doing just uh not just but almost all is like nld stuff yeah i've always liked your system of testing those males and trying to get the uh you know 10 percent value of uh, uh and get an idea of what the thc is going to be running at yeah, so I tested them. I've done it a couple different ways. I use um, uh, MCR out here in Framingham, and I've tested them when they just start to show. And what I actually do is I pluck off all of the pollen sacs, and I'm using the stems and, and the leaves. It's the top. It's part of the process where um, I'm going to put them into reveg, and then I actually send them to the lab and and just the THC inherent in the plan has come back anywhere from two to four. So I'm looking at what's inherent in the plan itself without looking at the trichomes. I've pulled off the pollen sacs. Um, it's kind of interesting. I mean, sometimes I think it's, it's more value than others. I've had other ones where I really, really like the male. I think it's the best male and it's not the one that's the top THC. Um, but that fish piss that I used, I, I picked the top THC one, not the best one, and that turned out to be a um, a pretty prolific male. So yeah, I, I think, think you it, sent me pollen that was two point nine percent, and yeah. uh, I never did get to use that. I don't even <laughs> know what project. I think it's in the freezer still. <laughs> Might be right next to that chocolate. I mean the uh, chocolate <laughs> tie that you just sent me. Yeah, that was a pretty good one. Uh, off subject uh, for you is um, when I first germed the seedlings, you know, when they were, you know, cotyledons were green and the whole deal. And you, and you said that purple stem would look good to you. So I've, I've pretty yeah. much grown them out and given them away. That one with the purple stem is by far the best plant. <laughs> it, I think that's what a couple people have said. It's got that red stem. Uh, it's it's a natural, you know, genetic red stem. Errol, the Yellowhammer, you got to know about the red stem genetics, huh? Oh, yeah. That's funny. I was just fixing to say, um, a couple years ago, I grew out some um, banana sundae from Canarado. And it was, um, what was that? Um, the Sunday driver, I think, crossed to the um, uh, banana OG. And I didn't really see a lot of the um, purple red stem trait, you know, pop up in, in that, which I only ran, I think, 20 of those seats. And they were regular, so I had probably like 12 or 14 females or something like that. But um, I crossed that to my blueberry OG male, and I, I made those seeds um, several years ago, and I popped them this, this summer for the first time just – I was like, man, you know, I, I, I made so much shit. It's just, you, you know, I'm sure you guys are like me, or it's like I could grow a million plants every year for the rest of my life and still not be able to really work out all the stuff I've made. Or um, have enough room. Or have enough room, right? Like that's the that's the biggest problem is just like the room, the time, and the, you know, the bandwidth to do it all. But anyways, this year, so I noticed with that, uh, just the, I call it Blueberry Sunday, and I had about 50% of the females that were exhibited no um, red, blue stem. And I saw that, I used to see that trait pop up in DJ Short's blueberry line a lot, um, where his, his blueberry um, had a, a green stem pheno and kind of a red, blue stem pheno. And I think that's probably where this came from. But hands down, like the, the bluish, purple, red stem phenos are they there's no comparison between those and the ones that are green uh, as far as just the ease of growth uh, 
structure, the flower quality, the terpene profile. I mean, almost every every box that you're looking to check, the the green ones are just they're more they're more prone to powdery mildew. I mean, it's been it like I don't think we've had a week all year where it hasn't rained. Um, this is it's here here in Mass. Like it's been the wettest um, the wettest summer uh, that I've experienced anywhere. I lived in Oregon and California and Nevada and, and Alabama and it's uh, Colorado and it's this has been a wet wet summer. And those green the green phenos are just they're not there like they're just not so. Um, it's an interesting trait. Like I noticed, there's been some research coming out here lately from different groups about anthocyanins and um like the, i think there was uh, a, a paper or uh, some research that noticed anthocyanins were actually associated with a, a increased resistance to um obsolete and viroid things like that so um i thought that was interesting i believe that, that might have been from medicinal genomics um uh, kevin mckernan and those guys may have noticed that if i remember right that anthocyanins, plants that have anthocyanins have a higher resistance to just things across the board. In my personal experience, I've noticed the plants with anthocyanins have a much higher resistance to frost damage. So like plants in the field that are expressing that purple, red, you know, coloration, I see a lot less damage later in the year if we get an early frost or uh, freeze. I don't know if you guys have seen right, anything our, like our, that. Our, our early summers are in, in June always have 40 and 45 degree nights. So if you're starting up your, you know, outdoor starts and uh, it'll tell you what plants are just loaded with anthocyanin and drill early in the process of growing. And then it proves itself again later, you know, but right. I noticed that the red stems, uh, it has to be anthocyanin. The, the bugs, not only does the powder mildew less prone, but insects and pests will be on that green one where they won't touch that red one. And I think yeah. it's the anthocyanin that's driven, uh, keeps the, the pest away. Cause I've seen aphids go right to the green ones and never touch the red stem. I'm growing some, uh, mango bee shade. That's a red stem, uh, Colombian mango bee shade, uh, that come from surfers in Tasmania. So it's been around the damn earth and it was one of their favorites. Call it, they call it rip snort, but it has that natural red stem, uh, it's it's really interesting some of those uh those plants they have uh, a spicy like uh almost nutmeggy sometimes uh terpenes to them too so they're they are different in a lot of ways not just the anthocyanin in them but their uh, their terpenes are usually not right down the main line yeah josh yeah. josh you know what the weather's like because i'm i'm sitting in 24 hours of rain right now it's pouring outside all day uh, yeah I, I but i got one plant from uh saturnalia in oregon and he sent me a really nice cut of a uh, federated hawaiian sativa and it's a it's a red stemmed plant i mean i got it from his mom it's red stemmed it's definitely red stemmed it's got nothing to do with you know nutrients and i've had that outside for a month and a half two months that that had that plant hasn't had a lick of problems and i've had couples start to get pm that i've cleaned up the and and you're right they're the green ones um you know because the weather has been just absolutely awful but that that hawaiian sativa that's not had a lick of problems the, the entire time which is amazing yeah there's got to be some kind of um there's got to be something going on molecularly there with that you know that trait that uh, that we should be able to identify with some you know genetics work in the lab be able to take and look at the markers and see you know what traits are being expressed in the green ones and the verse in the or the purple ones versus the green ones and you know can you tie those traits to you know things like powdery mildew resistance or pest resistance i've noticed the exact same thing this year like uh, aphid pressure hasn't been horrible this year. It's been, you know, a little. Um, also, septoria. That's something else that we have a lot of problem with here in New England is septoria, um, especially when we were doing hemp fields. Like, people would take their lawnmowers and cut the grass between the rows, slinging all of the, 
infected septoria grass up on the side of their plants. And I, I've watched septoria take a field out completely in a week. Like beautiful, happy, healthy plants just decimated, meaning like total complete loss in a week um, from septoria. It's a fungus that, um, you know, infects the, it starts with the fan leaves. It usually starts at the bottom of the plant and it just works its way up. Uh, it gets really bad on tomatoes and some of the other crops, um, nightshades and stuff, uh, potatoes and other things. But it hits hemp and cannabis really hard. But the anthocyanin and express in plants are much less likely to suffer kind of that catastrophic level infection yeah, for I, some I, reason. I, I've seen the septoria at a friend's and it's ugly. I mean, they just go brown and die like right away. I mean, it, yeah, it's crazy. It, it, yeah, it's ugly. And that knock on, I'm knocking on wood right now. I, I have not experienced <laughs> it, but, but I've seen it and it's, it's a bad look. <laughs> yeah. I saw, I saw it for the first time. You, meant, you mentioned that red stem. Go ahead, Sorry about that. I saw it for the first time ever this year, uh, outdoors in Maine. It was clo too close to a tomato plant. I think like Josh was just saying, and it destroyed the plants. Like it's a formidable enemy. Like, you know, I just, I abandoned that section. It was just toasted quick, especially as yeah. a property that I don't go check that often. It's kind of like a hobby property and uh, they just got dusted really fast. I also wanted to say anecdotally, I think with the anthocyanin, with you guys seeing so many plants, I think there might be something to it. The ones that usually don't have it in their genetics to express it, but when they get exposed to cold nights, it seems like a lot of genetics will start doing that. Perhaps that's a clear cut indication that they are defending themselves from a cold and maybe it could be pests as well as their immune system kind of fades out towards the end and the, the conditions get a little rougher. I wonder what you guys think about plants that might not generally show anthocyanin under ideal circumstances, but maybe under pest pressure or cold evenings, like genetics that don't like, that's right where my mind went. You know, it seems anecdotally like that's what they're doing. It's just what you guys are saying, you know? Well, so I, I, there is something I, I find interesting, and, and I'm just going to blanket it as sativas versus, you know, equatorials, land races, that kind of stuff. The ones, if you have like a haze and, and there's, a, there's one that's purple and there's one that's green. So there's more anthocyanins in obviously in the purple one. And I think the green ones tend, tend to be better weed. I think the, the end product, I think the buds are better. I think the smoke is better. So in the sativas, I actually have stayed away from a bunch of the purples. And, and just because I think that I like, the, I like the end result better in the green plants. And my thought process is right or wrong is that just like the trichomes, anthocyanin, anthocyanin production is a defense system. And the trichomes are a defense system. So if the plant's going to use some of that defense system to protect the, the stalk and the leaves, then not as much of that defense system is going to work its way into the trichome. So that's, that's kind of the way I've gone with the sativa based. And the indicas, I honestly, I think are a little bit different. Um, but I, I, I've leaned towards the green ones for that particular reason. So that that's kind of my two cents on that. I firmly agree with some of my hunts recently on some NL5 haze crosses. On um, some of them, there's pretty clear cut green ones and purple ones. And my palette and uh, the way they grew definitely went all towards the green ones, where the purples had a beautiful exhale. And they had a little bit, you know, some qualities that were nicer, but the plants, I just, I liked all the green ones. So I can totally agree with that, that uh, some of maybe the hazier ones are the haze crosses. I definitely choose for the green myself. Yeah, I've noticed over the years that um, the, the plants that express a lot of, you know, anthocyanins on a whole, uh, or as in general rather, are usually not as good um, in quality product. It's not always the case. Um, I, I would agree that the indicus, uh, you know, more broad leafed short squatter plants seem like the hash plant type stuff. There, there seems to be something a little different going on with those. 
than on the sativa side of things. Um, the the equatorial sativas, um, you know, in their native heirloom ranges, they don't generally experience such cold temperatures that, that you know as they do when they're cultivated in you know New England or Washington or Alaska or you know Canada or Europe. So uh, there could be these ancestral you know traits, these ancestral genes, kind of talking about epigenetics that are expressed that, you know, link back to um, some of their, you know, more wild type uh, traits that are not necessarily beneficial for medicinal use. And that's might, might be why we see the anthocyanin expression associated with plants that aren't so, you know, desirable when it comes to the in quality product. But there are some plants that express significant anthocyanins that are that are quality product. Um, you know, it, it it just seemed to be kind of fewer and far between compared to the plants that don't express it. Yeah, Josh, I'd agree with you. I I think there's plenty of great anthocyanin producing darker plants, right? It's just that in the in the wispy kind of long growing stretchy sativas the green ones tend to be a little bit better. And I, like I said, I'm not knocking the, the anthocyanin or the purple or any of that. I just, I just think in that one small space, that's where I've seen a difference. And it, what you said makes a lot of sense. They weren't like at, at the epigenetic level, it wasn't required of them to change to produce anthocyanin because it was never cold. Right. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Okay. Real heavy, heavy natural anthocyanin and purple, uh, Mexican and African, and uh, just beautiful, stunning purple, but uh, near no high weed. I don't even know what the other cannabinoids would have been in it, but uh, they were land race, and uh, I, I have no comparison to what the green versions were, but I would say some of the most disappointing, best looking plants I've ever seen were those purples <laughs> like that. Yeah. Yeah, I grew up growing a lot of bag seed from Mexican brickweed in the late 90s and early 2000s down in Alabama. And we'd get some beautiful purple plants, man. Oh, my God. Like, you know, we'd plant our crop. And, and a lot of times we'd plant it. We might go check on it once, maybe, maybe. Um, but most of the time we didn't go back till it was harvest time, right? And so um, – we get there to harvest, you know, these just gorgeous, beautiful purple plants. And then you'd be so disappointed after they were dried, you know, like they just never hardly turned out. But then we had to have some every once in a while. Like we had some stuff that came from Oaxaca that um, it was like a Highland purple. Um, these guys used to go down and uh, where I grew up around Clay County and um, Cleveland County. And they used to in Alabama and they were, Growing, um, hybridizing a lot of the Mexican, Colombian. We had a lot of Colombian uh, that came up, and so it doesn't get super cold in Alabama, but it does get. You know, we do get a frost every once in a while in in early October, mid October, and so we would see some at the sign and expression back then. And like I said, every once in a while you get a really, you know, a really banger purple strain. But um, and that's what's so funny is it's like on the like. You know, if you look at the markets right now and what, what the markets are doing and what flowers being, you know, what, what what should the commercial cultivator look at doing and grow and all this stuff. And it's like, you know, everybody wants something with some purple or some color or something in it. And it's like if, if people really knew how hard and rare it was to find a like truly top shelf cultivar that expressed the type of purple traits that. You know, like it's they they want unicorns. You know, is basically what they're all after. So, so I'll make another comment on the purple. So, I have one. I still have the beans. I haven't grown it in three or four years, but it it goes back to um, family vault purple, which was an old old aficionado strain, and I, I don't think there was a lot released, and then it was crossed to purple hulk which came from in-house and i think they're pretty old i actually i've got f2s that i just haven't grown in a while 
but if I could say this correctly, it's probably the most amorous weed I've ever smoked. Women love it. It works for couples. It does wonders upstairs. And I sent and had it tested, and it all ranged between 13 and 16%. So it, it's not it's not going to sell at the dispensaries, right? But, but it's very effective, and um, I'll have to grow some the next year because I've only got about a half a jar left. So um, I love bud, huh? <laughs> it's it's worked. I mean, I I I've given it to people, and the response from everybody is the same. Like it really, really works. And then, what, but if you tested it, nobody's going to buy it because they're going to go, I can't buy a fifteen percent weed or a or a thirteen percent weed, but um, that's one of the few purples that I've actually, you know, kind of kept in the library. So th there are pluses without it having to be a 30 percenter. Did it have any yeah. interesting as far as minor cannabinoids or terps or anything that you noticed might correlate with it? Or was it just kind of a one off? It's just mad, mass chaos and mad science. Oh, it's just a big old, you know, purple streaks in the stems, beautiful purple buds. I mean, for the bag appeal was fabulous. The high is medium, uh, but the effect is is makes it worth keeping around. But if you know you're sitting around with the guys, it's not going to do a whole lot for you. <laughs> I, I'm a um, a Malawi diesel um, that I ran for a while that I got from a, a, a good friend out when I lived in Oregon, um, Tony Rushford. He gave me I don't know I think it was probably about. 12 or 15 uh, seedlings of this Malawi diesel that he had bred that was uh, was actually a one-to-one. -one. And the two that I kept were just the most beautiful purple um, flower that I've, I've ever seen. And, you know, for a one-to-one, -one, um, it tested pretty high. It's, it's total active cannabinoids came in you know, in, in upper 20s, low 30s, about kind of 12%, 12% split in between THC and CBD. And there were some other minor cannabinoids, but it had the most raunchous, diesel -y, gassy smell ever. And it was like, it was kind of like that where you could, you could smoke it, but it was, it was not something you wanted to just, you know, it was good for smoking during the day and it was great medicinally. But where it really shone was like in its, um, you know, in its bedroom effects. You know, it was like always all my friends would, uh, if I was ever, you know, gave some out, they would come back and ask me for the, um, for the, uh, for the herbal, uh, um, shit, what's those pills called? Boner pills? Um, yeah. The, the you know what I'm talking pill. about? Yeah, the blue pill. Um it was uh, yeah. I always come back wanting some more from that, and I've always I, there was a um, a write up in like Skunk Magazine a long time ago, and there was a strain in there that was you know being talked about for um, its aphrodisiac effects and whatnot. And I want to say it was purple as well. Uh, I distinctly remember the picture of the bud. I can't remember what strain it was. I think it was a TGA strain, maybe. But anyways. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. I wonder if there is any kind of correlation between, you know, the, that anthocyanin producing trait and, you know, the aphrodisiac effect of, of plants. There's so many questions, not enough data. Like we, we really need a, like a, we need a repository of, you know, uh, a, a way to catalog all of this data before all the pharmaceutical companies beat us to it. They're, get they're asked going, a lot. People yeah. asked a lot, you know, what strains are good for libido and uh, just about equal with what strains uh, make you laugh. Like the old, you know, <laughs> I wouldn't say elementary school day smoking, but like right at your earliest uh, yeah. smoking experiences, sometimes you could have a laughing fit and uh, people are always looking for, those two things so it would be interesting to uh, get it categorized to where you could actually direct somebody to something that'll get them right down that road well we're trying to, yeah we're trying yeah. to do that right yeah I mean, I'm, yeah I'm, yeah I'm, yeah, right? yeah 
I, I'm on the search for God pot. That's that's my goal. I'll, I'll probably never achieve it, but that's my goal. I, I, without taking mushrooms, you, you'll be able to smoke weed and see God. So I, I may yeah. die. I may die doing it, but I'm still trying. <laughs> and yeah, that's uh, that's what I think makes. Uh, you know, I remember Ben. I was living in Northern Cal, uh, uh, Reno, Northern California, kind of splitting my time back and forth between the two when. Skittles launched, and I remember the first time smoking Skittles, um, and I had that like first time I ever smoked laughing experience again. Like that was the first time, and I think that's part of because like the bag of pills, it was terrible. Like let's just be honest, Skittles doesn't have the best looking. I don't know if we can call it Skittles anymore. I think we have to call it Z or something now because of what. What the fuck ever, but like, um, so people, you know, it, that that's rare. If you do find one of those cult fars or one of those strains, it's really, you know, uh, that's a real trait, real uh, unique characteristic to to have season, you know, users uh, who can have that first time laughable experience again, the, you know, getting the giggles and, and all that. Oh, like I honestly just thought I'd never have it again. Like I remember pretty much stopping smoking for about six months and then hoping that like the next time I smoked that I would like have that kind of first time laughing giggles kind of feeling, but it just didn't happen. But then I was, I was smoking pretty regular and heavy at the time and, and, got some skittles and, and was just like oh shit this happened that's actually um, why i'm chucking my first pollen is to try to get the uh the giggle fest back in effect i think it might lie in a type two variety what i'm looking for with crossing is a nl5 haze into a mendocino pineapple which i think could combine I don't know. It's a mad science, and I really don't know what I'm doing, but that's what I'm going for. You know, I feel like the NL5 haze, some of that is so heady that, um, dude, that's that's space cadet. (laughs) Space cadet, we. I don't, I don't drink, but if I had alcohol and that shit together, you would be in a different fucking world. You're, you're definitely floating and spinning off into space that shit's beyond my control it's fucking honest so like you could get that laugh factor out of that like stuff i think it. yeah I, yeah I, the, the, the most psychedelic experience i was just actually talking about this the other day the most psychedelic experience i've ever ever had on cannabis like where i mean full-on near hallucinations like visuals and just time dilation and warped reality was from a northern lights haze cross yeah yeah like it's yeah, that last year i went through that i was testing out a whole handful of them and each one of them hit me completely different you'll get hit by a northern light you'll get hit by an average haze but you can get hit by some stuff that is so up and uh heady i just call it heady because you fucking lose yeah. everything from your knees down and you feel like you're honestly <laughs> like head on a string on a kite yeah. string or a balloon and yeah uh jesus you shouldn't yeah. drive yeah. at that point i can i can say that there are there's adverse effects at that point and that's what neville was yeah. warning of he said a, a seasoned smoker could smoke a joint of that and they couldn't ride their fucking bike away from the castle you know because they uh just can't control their motor functions that well i I got one of them right now that i it's an older strain it's called logie and it's absolutely laughing pot like somebody says something stupid and there's a half a dozen guys belly laughing that's what it takes you get that camaraderie and everybody has that certain uh Right, nobody that even knows why they're going. doing it. And it, the last time it happened to me, that chocolate tie that I sent you, that stuff got us this first joint, not so much, it's just good, up, well, good, like a well-being feeling. The second joint, we started becoming laughing at each other's um, shitty, stupid stories that we've all heard before. But, man, we went into, like, stomach-busting laughing fits on that chocolate tie. Have you have you uh, smoked much of that stuff? I haven't smoked any of it. Oh, man, that shit is so... The third joint's a different story. You start getting edgy and then too much energy and too much up. It's uh, it's super powerful like that. But that first and second joint, that is like some uh, first well-being, feel good, and then just like 
it takes over to your uh, you I, could go into a laughing fit on that you, you can know enjoy I, it i think a lot of it and comes the the one that i that logie the laughing pot i i lean that towards the santa marta gold and there's got to be santa marta gold and haze right i mean there has to be that that's that really like you said head on a string i mean you're up there you're laughing stupid i i like the colombian gold that santa marta I, I like that one a lot. I've not worked it as much as I'd like, but I, I think the stuff that I've had and the stuff that I've grown with the Santa Marta, it it's pretty it's giggle pot. I haven't experienced it. I have only grown a couple of uh, super nineteen eighty five uh, Colombian and then um, just some Colombian Panama Reds, and they uh, it's up energetic as hell, and uh, I've never had the the super laughs from it. It made me. It hit me hard after you finished the joint, and then you realize how potent this stuff really was. So <laughs> if you were to, if you weren't a seasoned smoker, you would have panicked, honest, on some of that. I love the insight that you guys have that it's more than the genetic; it's the camaraderie. Like perhaps when we were younger, how we're a lot of times we're looking for that. It's because we were with all our buddies doing wheelies on something, you know, having fun, and it's like. You could have given us oxygen we would have been side split in laughter so that's that's some mm. i've never looked at it that way you know you can get the genetic that'll bring it out but you really need that group to laugh with you're not just going to laugh by yourself i never really thought of it that way even though it's so simple it's happened to us on the boat uh having edibles one time a bunch of friends come up from the states and we we're camping out on the boat overnight and man we must have stayed up till about two in the morning just all of us were sore in the stomach the next morning from just foolish laughing but i think it was the the edible effect it just really did it for us and uh it's the camaraderie for sure you don't get all those you don't get that many special trips that's your daughter huh peter <laughs> yeah that's really a light bulb moment to me that's uh that's really got my mind going you know and that's what's so cool about the plant, you know, when you get a bunch of hooting people together with her, <laughs> the game on, start laughing. That's really cool. Yeah. You brought up type twos just a minute ago. I've been making um, a lot of type twos um, over the past couple of years and really diving into minor cannabinoids and exploring, you know, things outside the type one, type three world. And um, that's one of the things that I've, I've, really find interesting about the type twos is that it seems to me like if you go and look at feral populations of cannabis, most of the research that I'm able to dig up from the literature, which is not a lot, right? Like it's not a ton, but there's some out there. They primarily exist in a type two ratio as a bulk of the population. You're going to find some type one, some type three, but they kind of primarily exist in this mixed ratio form in a lot of the wild um, feral types. And it's interesting, some of the characteristics, like the effects that I see with the type one stuff. And it makes me kind of wonder, like going back to like my early days of smoking, you know, like we were smoking, you know, stuff that was imported from probably Colombia or Mexico um, down South. And, or if we were lucky, we would get stuff that, you know, somebody's uncle had grown or dad or whatever until we kind of started growing ourselves. And, you know, I'm wondering if there's some tie back to the type two, um, hey, you know, that, that mix of CBD. Yeah. Do, do me a favor for everybody and just give a quick explanation of type one, type two, type three. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So type ones are THC dominant plants. Those are the ones that are expressing the majority of the cannabinoid is THC, THCA uh, metabolites. You may have small amounts of CBD, CBG, CBC, CBN, C, um, uh, but they're all going to be uh, very minor amounts, like you know, one um, percent, maybe two percent, things like that. Um, type twos are a usually a one-to-one -one ratio or similar, maybe a two-to-one ratio of THC to CBD or maybe THC to CBG um, or some form of ratio between the major cannabinoids that are 
comprised in the, uh, of the metabolites. And then type three are your CBD dominant uh, plants with very little to no THC. And you have type four plants, which are CBG dominant plants, which is kind of the precursor cannabinoid to all of the downstream metabolites. And then you have type five, which are no cannabinoids at all. Um, there are a few type five plants that have just no, the, you know, no cannabinoid production. They're pretty rare, but, um, but yeah, the type one, type two, and type three, um, that terminology, I'm not sure exactly where it came from. Uh, I think Robert Colonel Clark, maybe, I, I think that's where I originally read it was in his marijuana botany book, if I remember right. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I get that. I, I get that question a lot. Yeah. Is uh, type five purely uh, a fiber? That's what I've seen it mostly being used for uh, um, in Europe is uh, the old non lines of uh, Italian yeah. and uh, fiber lines. Yeah. Yeah, like there. Uh, I mean, no detectable cannabinoids really whatsoever. You know, it's kind of no interesting. Problem. <laughs> yeah, I know it is, but I mean, from, from a genetic from a genetic perspective, it's like, how how did that happen? Like, how do you have the world's population of cannabis, like from all the different heirloom varieties that have, for the most part, a major cannabinoid production, and then somehow you have these lines that were bred to produce no cannabinoids whatsoever. You know, was it just that they were bred for fibers so much and they just constantly bred them that way that that's the way they just ended up? Was it some rare, you know, unique genetic mutation that caused it? Like, what caused the cannabis plant to decide, well, we don't, it, it, there's no need in cannabinoids. Do you know if they still have resin heads that are just devoid of any chemistry or are they, do they not have resin heads? Because that's where I would go. It's like, to me, that would be a whole bigger question. We'd have to ask why yeah. does it have resin heads and how can it exist without it? Or why would it want to exist without it? Yeah, does it have yeah. any defense system for sunburn and insects? No. That's what I'm really right. curious too. Well, like, what it, were the smells? What was any terps or smells off of that of the fiber types of cannabis? Is I wonder if it just smelled I like hay. It still has resin. It's just no. The chemistry is somehow screwy where nothing develops in there. But like my my, my bro science mind thinks there's got to still be some trichomes on there. Well, it's gotta, there's got there's got to be resin heads, or you wouldn't be able to breed it. Yeah, I mean, there's yeah, that, it, that's interesting. I don't know. I've never, I've never been able to grow a type five, or um, even I don't think I've ever seen one in person. Um, just read about them. You're well, saying the but, resin heads would correlate like the stigma, Boston Bob, where it would like it would have to have some to be fertile, essentially. Well, I mean, a resin head, right, is the calyx, right, which is waiting to get pregnant. So, it's I mean, like a. The actual trichome head, like the little resin head. Oh, the, oh, oh, you're talking about on the on the capitated glands, right? You're talking about, yeah, okay. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah good head. question. Yeah. I'm curious if those type fives would have anything like that. Like that's got my mind going all over the place. Yeah, I haven't really done a ton of research on the type fives. It would be, I mean, it wouldn't make sense for them to produce a capitate stalk trichome if they're not producing cannabinoids. You know, right. if that's the answer to the question. How did they get there? It's like, how on earth could they survive without it? Was it where the sun no. wasn't that that intense? There was enough cloud cover, Mediterranean climate. Was there not so much pest pressure, or 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 it was the best plant that produced fiber for rope, and they kept breeding that plant over and over? That's probably what it is. Yeah, well, a lot of those lines were eliminated too after the you know. Uh, the hemp revolution pretty much went out. A lot of these old genetic lines are not not ever to be found again. Maybe in uh, in herbarium form or something. Yeah, that makes sense to me, Bob, because it's so important. What do you know about uh, sailing uh, and stuff? Oops, sorry. What do you know about Chinesis, the fourth strain of uh, cannabis? I, I don't know a ton about it. I know it's uh, from a taxonomy and system, uh, systematic standpoint that, you know, there's a lot left to be um, decided as far as how we classify all this stuff. But um, there's I think there's more to be discovered than what we know right now, you know, and it's really exciting that 
hopefully we're getting to a point um, to where we can start to look at some of this stuff and really care, you know, like start to develop some of the typical scientific rigor, scientific, you know, um, studies that every other plant has been afforded for the most part, right? Cannabis has been in use for thousands and thousands of years, but right now we have the least amount of scientific data available about uh, economically viable crop compared to tomatoes or strawberries or oak trees or, you know, Ugaland AC, whatever. It just, um, are you that's, a, that's a good question. It's from the Yunnan region in China that are known to have like 50% plus CBD AK, uh, AK beans. Well, I've only heard of it from my friend. Uh, she runs the uh, Candor Herbarium and we would gotten into some discussions of it, but I know very little about it except that, uh, it's it's not really a drug type it's more of an industrial type but i imagine through selection there's got to be a wide range of unique cannabinoids that we haven't ever tested looked at or or had our handle on who knows what um what combination of effects you can get out of that if you were to do make a make a type two out of that right you know might might be a whole different ball game when it comes to different cannabinoids and pest resistance and Jesus, you could you could open up a whole new ball game, but nobody's really uh, dealt with it so much that I know of. I've got a, I've probably got and, uh, twenty. People, that's why I kind of mentioned that. Yeah, I've probably got twenty five or thirty different um, packs of seeds that I was gifted uh, from a family member who goes to China frequently and very quietly and, and discreetly co collected a lot of the seeds and their journeys throughout China. Um, they're just marked with the name of the like province and, province. and the location. Are they, large? They were, are, they, are they super large seeds? So and it's funny you bring that up. I've got some of them that are like, some of the tiniest, smallest cannabis seeds that I've ever seen, and then some of them look like pole bean seeds. Yeah. Do you think that's due to over over pollination on those tiny ones, or uh, just heritage of the plant? I, I don't know. I've been trying to figure that out myself because I've noticed over the years in breeding like such a wide variety of seed sizes that come off. You know, like I uh, last year I made some seeds with my um, that 95 AK blueberry cross and I crossed it to uh, the key lime pie OGKB that I'd made and the seeds that came off of that thing were massive. I mean, they were just like the largest cannabis seeds I've ever seen next to the ones that came out of China. But then I've got some seeds that came off of um, Centennial Seeds Auto 2 that are so T90 tiny that you can, you know, you're like, is this going to pop and turn into a plant? You know, it's like, seriously, they're not too much bigger than a poppy seed, you know? Huh. Yeah. But they germinate. Like they yeah, germinate. I've, and seen they grow small, I've, I've seen the seeds that are so small that I doubt that they could grow a plant. And I was, yeah. you were shocked when that thing grows a cannabis plant. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, it comes up just happy and healthy as any other I've ever grown. Yeah. Yeah. yeah they come out of nowhere. I, I, mean, I, yeah, want, I, want, I want comments from you guys. I had a plant last year. And it was inside, so that means it's about four feet. And I got ninety five hundred seeds off of one plant. Damn. Oh Jesus! That is and that's a, 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 a so that's a lot other, of seeds. It, I've, it's you know if if you do the mac, when I, I was working Mac one for a while, you get fifty seeds. <laughs> off of <four laughs> Right. If, you, if you're lucky, you get 50 seeds. Right. And, <laughs> and, and, and my average is 800 to 1200 on a four footer that I'm using natural pollination, right? Which seems to be about the right number. And, yeah. and I got this plant last year and it gave me 9,500 seeds. That's just so many thousands of viable pistols right there. And everyone took yeah. it's right. Insane. It's unbelievable. Were, were they tiny? There's no room for seeds no. once you're. That's I mean like they were you 50%, know percent sixty percent seed weight on that plant that's crazy. Uh, so I I do them by the gram, 
So like, you know, you, you take 50 and then you take a hundred and you weigh them and then you start to weigh them. That's how I count them. I don't have any fancy seed sorters. And the, the weight was generally not that much less, you know, instead of maybe getting a canister where I'd get 80, 80 seeds in, I got a hundred in there. So maybe they were 20% smaller than the oh, average seed. But I mean, interesting. you look at them, you, you, they could be off a plant that gave you three or 400 seeds. They, they weren't well, tiny. 9,500 is one hell of Yeah. I've never seen, I, I mean, I don't, I've never, I, I've done outside plants that are eight, nine feet tall in an open pollination, not in my neighborhood. And, um, you know, you get three or 4,000 seeds. Off of, what, off do you, of, what do you attribute this anomaly to, Bob? I think it's what Dave said. I, I think there were so many pistols. And they all took, I mean, it's, I mean, I, I take it, I take it, I take it as a good sign on the mom, right? Because, you know, for every pistol, there's, there's a potential of a resin sack. And a good sign on the male too, because, you know, yeah. a lot of male pollen is, is pretty much born with one day existence. I think this stuff yeah. wants to be bred and the next day, I mean, by the time you cure it out and store it and think you're going to move it over to a female and, uh. 50 well, percent dead at that point and that's well, only a couple days out well i think between yeah. you and i dave we're trying to find out whose pollen can go the longest anyway so i think so <laughs> yeah <laughs> my best my best may be six years for frozen and put up properly but my best room temperature is four years well yeah. i got i got i got five years right now outside <laughs> so i and i and honestly i don't know if it's taken but i got um i got five years little it, it's yeah i've got a test right here this is um vietnam black, billy goat yeah. vietnam black and this is like i don't know what they're st it's still just super fluid and uh like yeah, looks good and uh so, it's been at room temperature with a tiny bit of uv on it but at two years i'm just letting it sit around i look at it every now and then it's like maybe i'll test it this batch on something here and there but nothing's really yeah, so I've I know I've got up to three. I got another plant that I just did literally two weeks ago that was about over three years. The five years I don't know if it's taken yet. But the one thing I found for storing pollen for anybody out there who's gonna, you know, try to keep it and store the pollen is butcher's paper. Because the stuff, yeah. right? If you if you use um what's the other stuff we use? Parchment. But, yeah, parchment's awful, right? Because parchment yeah retains moisture and holds it in so what i do is i i make little packets of um of butcher's paper because it's it's slightly porous and then i surround it by uh, rice and then i put it in another ziploc and i just keep it in dark cool and so far so good but the key was switching from parchment to butcher's paper because it allows any moisture that's that's in there at all to get out and actually go someplace and not touch the pollen. Right. Yeah, pollen is so susceptible to just the tiniest bit of fluctuation in humidity. Um, humidity, temperature, UV. Yeah. You you look at it cross, and I do believe that stuff <laughs> dies. If you're yeah. not joking. It's, it's hard uh, to keep it alive. It's hard to keep it yeah. liable. I believe yeah. I think it's going to send it out in the mail to anybody. I've, had, I've successfully sent like the Mac when he did, when he released that seed uh, batch, I sent to like seven different places and five different continents. So I put it, sent it to India and Australia and, and that stuff was viable. I went to Thailand. I went to all these different places. You should never be sending Mac uh, genetics to, but at that point, right. you know, the world, the world's already so scrambled, but those people were, yeah. they're never going to be able to get their hands on the actual uh, Mac one. And everybody was, at the time super interested in uh in the genetics so uh but i sent that stuff viable but it was about uh 15 grams off of two small plants it was just an insane amount of pollen that came off of that just the the, the weight wise it was it was super profuse pollen so uh, maybe that's why the viability was so good when it made its journey so how do you guys dry your how do you dry your pollen like so i i usually will you know uh because that's that seems to be the more difficult part is i've tried multiple to, things uh, uh, uh incubator for chicken hatching eggs works good because you can set the uh it's always got a 
a humidity and temperature yep. control and you can set it at 80 75 or 80 and slow dry it and really control the humidity and um mainly thing is the humidity what will kill it first the fastest i do believe so and next yeah. thing would just be put it in the ambient room temperature 75 degrees and give it like two days of air drying and um you uh at that point you better store it or use it because it goes downhill quick yeah so what seems I... like it stalls if you store it right up after the you cure it tends to be viable for the whole time you're storing it but if you store it and just let it sit around and don't use it in about a month's time you could have very low viability on it so what i do is july is usually my mail month right so if i'm if i'm coming to the final testing it's usually end of june through july because none of the other stuff i have outside is really coming into flower so i don't i don't risk cross-pollination so i run inside my mails in july but the just the ambient temperature and humidity is too high so honestly i don't even cure it what i do is i collect it and just shake the plant on a piece of glass and then within seconds i just i literally shake the glass and i remove all the plant material so there's nothing but pollen uh, and on the piece of glass i clean it then i actually use 91 percent alcohol on the glass right because that'll take up some moisture and then right. right before i collect the pollen i actually take flour but what i do is i put flour in the microwave for about a minute ah okay it, sterilize and, it well what now what it does is i think flour is generally like uh like 10 to 12 percent um humidity mm -hmm. or moisture yeah. content yeah and if you put it in for a minute it gets down to two to four and then i rub the surface with the flour so when that pollen hits and and then i wipe off the the flour but when the pollen hits the sheet there's nothing but pollen and if the moisture is already there then the pollen's dead and if the moisture is not there then i'm going to store it right away which is why i don't cure it and even those um those little packets of butcher paper i literally put the paper in the microwave and i microwave the paper for a minute so I'm trying to get every single piece of moisture and I collect it, I razor blade it, I put it in the packets, I surround it with the, with the, um, with the rice and then I double zip it. And so far, so it's, you, it's you so got far like, an, yeah, you got an extreme desiccant situation where you're, you're taking fresh pollen and trying to pull that moisture away from it. Cause you know, one thing I learned in chemistry class way back was, um, especially when I was in like more advanced chemistry labs was you have to dry your glass, right? Like if you're using glass beakers and you're in analytical chemistry and you've got to weigh stuff that like, you know, down to the 10 thousandths of a gram, your glass beakers or a sheet of glass or a piece of glass, it actually holds quite a bit of moisture exactly. and because right, glass is a liquid uh, essentially. And so just a very high viscosity liquid. So putting that piece of glass, or if you're capturing on glass, you can put it in the oven at 150 degrees or 200 degrees for a couple of hours and dry that glass out. But you got to be careful though, because if you just set it out to let it cool in an ambient, you know, 75% humidity environment, it's going to suck that moisture right back up. Um, so I, that's a very interesting technique. I like that a lot. Um, instead of trying to dry the pollen before storing it, just make the drying of the pollen part of the process. Yeah, I, I might have to try that. Because I've, I've been doing kind of old school where I'll collect the pollen and then uh, basically use a desiccant system where I've got some like lab grade desiccant, silica based desiccant that I put in a, in a glass that I set the pollen in there and leave it in there for a couple of days to let it dry out and then i'll take and store it and um in glass vials and then i you know i vacuum seal those and put them in a the freezer and all That's that pretty no, common a yeah. lot of people will put the small cooler fill it with rice let that little uh, dish or um you know wherever you've laid out your pollen on it and let it let it do a natural absorption of all the humidity that's in that pollen and then put it up so i've never tried that but uh tend to it works okay i've got some yeah, I mean, I've got, so it's like it's like all pollen. I think you put it up, you keep it frozen. As long as you keep it frozen, don't look at it funny, don't smell it, don't just leave it alone. 
and, and it, you take it out and you let it fall out and then you use it immediately. Like you can't take it out and let it sit for two weeks and then use it and you're going to lose viability. Mm -hmm. Like right. you got to take it out and as soon as it's kind of room temp, you boom, you use it. And I, I sometimes I don't even let my warm up. I just like take it out, you know, whatever, however I'm going to use it. Yeah. I've yeah, been so told to let it step down, uh, you know, refrigerate it before you freeze it yeah. and refrigerate it after you freeze it, let it step down to room temperature. But uh, yeah. I've done like you. I've pulled it out as long as it's very uh, uh, dry and can be dispersed with no problem. I've done it right out of the freezer and to have yeah. success with it. So I don't know that the other steps are necessary. You, got, yeah. I don't, you, you, should, you don't have to baby it. No, no, not too much. I mean, you think too, like a, a refrigerator and refrigerator and a freezer also are, are you know, they remove moisture from the from the environment as well. So they're well, as long as they're in the refrigerator or in the freezer, it's keeping the moisture away from the pollen. Yeah, yeah and always always good tip is to put them in small uh, small packages, double you know, double package it for sure with double yeah. desiccants inside and another package with desiccants inside that, but smaller packages so you don't ever have to pull out a large amount and pull them pull something off and refreeze it. If you have it in uh, usable like Bob does, he has it in parcels that are small enough to do a fairly good sized breeding and then you can just pull out that one little pack and uh, breed with it from there as opposed to having 10 grams of one strain in a in a storage yeah. container unless you're doing yeah. a field all at once right because then now you got to use all that at one time yeah you know? yeah, yeah 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 that's for sure i know i'm going to try to store some pollen this year from some reversals and stuff i made um yeah, I, I usually I, in the winter, I, I, you know, I our winters all. are so crappy and long. We can, you know, six, seven months, you'd be able to take your, you know, ammo container full of pollen out to the front porch and uh, do an inventory of everything and uh, everything stays frozen and uh, it's all right. driving. Unless you have a walk in freezer, you know, uh, you can't even really look at it during the summer months. You don't want to, you don't want to, if you've got it all set up like that, you know. So it's, it's touchy stuff, that pollen. I hate to lose a whole lot due to, I mean, I've seen uh, maybe three or four years worth at a time go bad due to small miscalculations or freezer going bad. So, uh, you know, once, yeah. it, once, once the humidity builds up or you have some kind of strange situation, you could all go, it could all go away quick. A lot of work. Yeah, I double up. I, I put maybe a quarter of it in the freezer. And I use yeah. a, and I vac, I use a, you know, one of those food vacs, right? One of those sealers. I, yeah, I'd I, say the way you did it, you get about two years out of your packs and then four years out of your frozen, freezing long-term packs. So it's a good system. I, and well, I think the, so the ones that I just did to a three year with that Jaguar pollen, that was July of 2020. So it's a little over three years and that was never in the freezer. That was just using the butcher paper and the rice and then double double bagging it. But what I what I do is I keep it in cardboard boxes. Yeah. Because cardboard boxes, it. right? Because they they're gonna absorb moisture before anything else around it. Nice dark, even temperature though. Yeah, it sits in the bottom of a closet in in a in a place that, that the 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 temperature and humidity tend to stay pretty constant and that's it and then i i take it out so and I, I think i'm getting seeds i i think i saw seeds literally i think i posted a couple days ago or today even that i that i think i'm going to get some seeds from the three-year pollen that was not in the freezer so that would it's be funny a, you could look at some of them plants after you've read them for a week or 10 days straight and you're thinking you didn't get one damn seed and then on the 12th day all you see is nothing but a burst of seeds just every calyx took well, plus yeah. when I'm plus when I'm trying to get three year pollen working, I see seeds that aren't even there. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Oh, yeah, I know it's that's one of the things like I've been having to fool with is like it seems like I don't know if you guys are seeing this. I'm sure you are. It's like uh, most people are wanting to start to grow feminized seed. You know, like there's been kind of like it was in there you know, early kind of mid two thousands when feminized seed, yeah, it's like there's a another big resurgence in female seeds and I did a I did a trial this year 
uh, interestingly enough, where I took a bunch of feminized seeds and germinated them next to regular seed. And like the, uh, and there was a very similar cultivar, like very similar lineage um, between the two. And the vigor was so different. Like the female feminized seed just, just doesn't have the vigor that, that regular seeds do. Yeah. Um, so, no, no, I was going to say for that, like the feminized, I, I pretty much do S ones only and I'm doing S ones, yeah. right? Because you get a clone only, or you get this beautiful plant and you have no more seeds. So you can't go look for another one and you have this one plant. So to me, I, I risk losing the plant, you know, I'll clone it a couple times yeah. and, and S ones, but, S1s are kind of it for me. I've not really produced a lot of feminized that aren't S1s. I've, I've done a couple of lines of, you know, uh, feminized that's not, you know, an S1 that's a feminized outcross. And it's it's tricky. Um, it definitely brings about uh, um, some unique expressions and characteristics. The S, you know, selfing is a great way, though, to, you know, to save a cultivar if you're going to, you know, if you've got an old cut that's just, you know, on its way out or, you know, maybe tissue culture is not an option to revitalize it or, you know, or you just want to, you know, make more seeds of that particular, you know, plant. It is very similar. I did that with the key lime pie um, and several others over the couple of years and the ones that I've grown out from those S ones have been, you know, I was always like, Oh man, I really hope that this, these seeds express like the original mom did. And it might not get exactly, exactly the same, but you're going to get something pretty close. If you know, and you don't have to hunt through a ton of seeds to find it. But when you do a feminized outcross where you're taking feminized pollen and going from one to the next, there's all kinds of crazy stuff that's popping up, you know. Well, well, we like hunting males, so if we're making feminized seeds, we don't have too many males to hunt. Yeah, yeah, that's it, and that's part of it. I, I'm, you know, I saw. And I'm not going to mention his name, but there was a, a a a breeder who's, you know, relatively well known, and he made the comment several years ago. There's no need for male cannabis plants and cannabis breeding you know, from this point forward. And I'm like, ah, no, no, that's not true. Like there definitely is a need for male plants because, you know, cannabis has one of the largest sex link, um, you know, sections of, of, it, of its chromosome of all living organisms, not, not just for plants, but like the sex link traits, um, are for cannabis one of the largest you know chunks of the chromosome and so it's the male plant brings to the cross um a lot of genetic information that's really viable that you are excluding if you're only doing feminized you know uh work and I, I just wholeheartedly disagreed with that that statement that males aren't really an important part of you know the breeding process because I think they're I think they're critically vital to uh, you know to breeding. You're right. I, I I breed chickens, so I understand the sex link options and uh, you know resource of that. But uh, it's not only that, but it's a extreme bottleneck. If that's what I'm worried about. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I, Josh, if I agree with you 100 percent too. I, I I'm a I'm a fan of, of regular seeds. Yeah. The male gape that yeah. Males are the only thing open open pollination with men. It's in your uh and uh what already been inbred S S one and feminized, it's down from very slim genetics to stars, so doesn't make any sense yeah no it doesn't and you know you you brought up the term bottleneck and just a moment ago and you know i i know we're probably not in a place right this moment where cannabis is at risk of a bottlenecking event but i don't think with the kind of global um shift in cannabis policy that we've seen over like the past couple of years 
and with a lot of the hybridization that's taking place and things like heirloom, you know, and, and um, you know, kind of local populations getting, I wouldn't say manipulated, but are contaminated with outside genes, you know, we could be looking at a situation in a decade or so where cannabis could be at risk of a bottlenecking event. Um, especially if we were to take a, you know, feminized only approach to, to cannabis breeding, um, that would, that would make that process that speed that up side, quite uh, quickly. It, I would say a lot of the, uh, feminized stuff is already toward, on the road to bottlenecking just due to the slim, uh, genetics that they've yeah. chosen to pull it out of. There's only, there's only so far you can go down that road. And yeah. I think it's near I'm right now. Yeah. Yeah. And I've tried to reverse some, like, um, I've tried to reverse some of the, you know, more like land race, um, stuff uh, and some older stuff that like folks really aren't fooling with, um, for reversals and it, it, it doesn't respond well to it. Like a lot of the, I was gonna... um, a lot of the older cuts, they, like it just won't reverse. Like, it's just like, Nope, sorry. Uh, not, not, it's not happening. Actually, have, so you like any, uh, have you done any uh have you done any uh land I, race land race s1 stuff or reversals me I'm yeah i think if i if i read I've, I've been trying i've been trying to i and that's what i'm saying like i've you know i've done a lot of reversal i mean over the past you know since 2014 i've probably made you know at least half a billion feminized seeds when i was doing large-scale cbd feminized production and so i've spent a significant amount of time reversing you know females and i've got several different recipes for um for reversals and or for you know for ethylene inhibition essentially and i've there's some of the some of the land race stuff like some of the you know, non-hybridized, more true breeding cannabis lines that I, they just will not reverse. Or if they do reverse, the pollen's not viable. Are so those it, same uh, varieties, do they have that end of the life uh, trying to save themselves with single bananas like ties and other equatorials? Will they do that, but they won't reverse under ethylene uh, restriction? Yeah, like you, you put a, you know, standard uh, silver thiosulfate, uh, but it, it, that does nothing, you know, like the silver just does nothing at all. So else that tells you it's just not been trampled on and uh, manipulated. It's wanting to yeah. follow its own route. Yeah. So I have a yeah. thought, pro I have a thought process in the reversal. I like both of your comments. So I, I use the STS, right. And I've done a bunch of different, um, reversals. And my thought process is, the, the genetics of the plant that I'm trying to reverse, the harder it is for it to reverse, the less likely it is that that plant's going to harm. I think that's a reasonable statement. I, I, yeah, I, I think I've noticed that a little bit. Like if you get a female that you want to reverse and you do, you know, if you notice that that plant is just very easy and a full reversal with, you know, little to no spray in and little attention to it, I think there are intersex traits associated with that ease of reversal. Good. I mean, yeah. essentially, that's what in this intersex traits are, right? It's like the plant doesn't, the plant doesn't have a proper ethylene production uh, and metabolic pathways in place. So what happens is you get a a uh, uh, partial expression female, partial expression male, because both traits are there and there's not enough ethylene to produce. Because I've even played around with this where I've taken a plant that I know for a fact that herms, every time I grow it, it'll herm. And then I take and put ripe bananas and ripe fruit in there to increase the ethylene in the room with the plant and it'll show no, it'll show no intersex traits whatsoever. So oh, wow. for the, the reverse of that, I think is that if you have a plant that reverses super easy, I think they are more prone to passing on potential intersex traits. Yeah, because I I had one that was I I I know is a very very stable plant, and I probably used four to eight times the STS that I would use on a regular plant to the point where I pretty much burned every single fan leaf. Right, the plant was next to being dead just to get it to generate a little bit of pollen. And it, yeah. and it and it's anecdotal evidence, which is why I wanted to comment from you guys because it 
it seems that that's probably reasonably true. Yeah, I, I, I've had the same similar experience. I haven't done enough reversals, probably only a half a dozen, so I really couldn't say. I've messed with ethylene, uh, and I used gibberellic acid for reversals in the 80s. That was basically the first time that we ever reversed and tried it, and uh, nobody even knew about colloidal silver at that point. It was like, yeah. you know, 88 right around then and um, you heard a little bit of talk from uh, maybe uh, Ask Ed or Mel Frank or somebody they talk a little bit about reversals more about natural reversals and end of life type of stuff so I don't know I, I have I've grown plants in apple trees trying to get bigger you know ethylene induced flowers and and uh, crazy experiments like that in the, in the 80s I tried a lot of silly shit or have cases of apples I come across a produce deal where I could get a ton mm -hmm. of fruit. You know, I put cases of apples in the in the bud rooms, just trying to increase ethylene production, and uh, without getting, you know buying a tank of the damn gas itself. But just all the yeah. playing around with it, you definitely can influence a plant's expression hardcore with ethylene. They'll show different uh, way way more uh, for indoors. They'll look way more outdoors once you're putting ethylene to them pretty pretty cool plan with that those hormonal gases but you said for indoor plants if you're growing indoors and you add that ethylene they kind of express more like they're being grown outdoor yeah they look like more yeah, I've seen that. for sure yeah yeah you'll get pistols that can turn pink and uh, all yeah. a lot of little expressions that outdoors will do yeah yeah i've, I've, I've kind of noticed that when i've you know, played around with ethylene in rooms uh, just to try to prevent plants from, you know, going harm. That, and I, I, you know, just thought maybe it was a, a you know, weird coincidence, but uh, that's interesting. You've noticed the same. Hmm. Yeah. Well, when you I've, mentioned the red stem was more uh, easy to, uh, to hide the, the hop latent viroid, that, that kind of freaked me out. You could pass a red stem off easy with the with the virus being or viroid being latent and never know it's in there. And still, when you're flowering it, it's still not wanting to show due to due to its resistance of showing. And then that stuff would spread like wildfire to other through vectors. You know, uh, it could be a yeah. it could be a, a bad ticket right there. You know, I never really thought about that. You're right. Um, I, I don't know sure if, if it's it in was, there. Yeah, I need to. I want to go back and look at some of the some of the papers that are some of the research that was done on that because I don't know if it was, you know, if it was that the viroids able to, you know, or, or the red stem or the anthocyanin trait just makes it where it's you know immune to the viroid, or is it that? the plant still has the viroid it's able it's just that its immune system is able to beat the viroid back to where it doesn't show but then that still you know poses a significant risk to the rest of your growth right because like yeah. you could be spreading the viroid around and not knowing that you've got a plant that has it because it might yeah. it might yeah. keep the viroid level below non-detect even though it's still there yeah that's the thing with testing. A lot of times a, a plant that's latent, unless you're tapping the top end of that root portion, uh, some of the new growth will not detect. It'll just say not detectable on the testing and uh, could be an infected plant that you know for sure is infected. So yeah. it's a slippery slope that that viroid. I got it and spread it through con you know conservative methods of just using jdam barrel i put all my vegetative material in one deal and reuse the nitrogen but oh really the, the viroid will just turn into a viroid soup at that point and then as soon as you put it to anything it, you're just top feeding or uh, basically putting it right to your root See, systems and um it could be totally detrimental to everything I, you have at that i've point. wondered about that with like this summer i made some um some fpj with you know some some you know fan leaves and you know shit off the plants and i was like and i knew that all these plants were from seedland so i, I was that i had made so i was 
pretty much 100% confident they didn't, but it did cross my mind. It's like, well, what if I was making this FPJ out of plants that I hadn't tested or didn't know or had the viroid? Would I be, you know, every, if I did a foliar, am I spreading this it's hop latent viroid now? Stinging nettle and in a uh, thistle, it's tested positive in a lot of rugged plants. So even <clears throat> though that won't make that plant show symptoms, it could pass to cannabis. So let's wait say- a minute, Wait a minute, wait a minute. You're saying that stinging nettle and thistle and, and other plants have tested positive? TV. If you make a ferment with that, oh. it might not affect the stinging nettle. It might not show any symptoms or have any effects. But if you were to, let's say, make a ferment out of that, drench it into your roots or get it into an open wound or however you want to do it, it can, it's, you know, it seems like it has the potential to be in everything. It has right. it's jumped out of uh, cannabis and hops industries and gone into different agricultural industries now. Uh, my friend that runs Candle Herbarium, she also has LeafWorks uh, DNA where they do, you know, a lot of testing and uh, appellations and just a ton of work with cannabis. But she said that she's gone to conferences where people are aware of it jumping into agricultural lines of foods now. And it's it mainly... Tell the things really heavily stressed from fruiting, and then you're seeing a massive amount of uh, loss for production in weight and size of the fruits. And uh, so this could be a, it could be a pretty nasty thing. That stuff to, and it wants to stay alive for six months in an organic compound like the soil, or um, if the root system sitting there, it'll stay alive in that root system for six months. So it's got a tendency to uh, spread easily if you're reusing any soils or. It's pretty crazy stuff. So it's spreading on a dry flower for over a year. I didn't mm -hmm. know. Oh, I've heard six months, but that's even more terrifying. On a dry flower, you could have a, a plant material or like, let's say, root mass, like you're saying. Like if you dry and cure a flower, yeah. you go and break it up allegedly. You know, that's what science is saying. It can stick on even it can stick on a dry flower for up to a year. Like that's crazy to me. You know, this stuff is it's crazy. It's, it's pretty industrial strength. Well, it's, it doesn't. I mean, it's just a you know, it, it's just a segment of RNA. It's not even you know, it's not a living organism. You basically just have the a protein sitting there. You know, the strand of of ribonucleic acid that uh, it finds its way into the plant and then wreaks all kind of havoc. Um, that that's rather scary that it's jumping from hops and cannabis into other agricultural products is, and, ha because and having an impact. That's the first I've heard of food shortages around the world already. So all we need to do is get into a, into a grain supply and uh, we're in trouble. Whether it's our own feed, I, I feed a lot of animals. So, you know, I'm paying yeah. 70 cents a pound for my, my chicken feed, my uh, even corn oats and barley just uh, averages 66 cents a pound for my corn oats and barley that I feed to different animals up here. So can you imagine having feed shortages? We kind of like ran into these high prices due to the Ukraine is lacking on mm -hmm. sending out a lot of the grains and cereal grains and stuff for the rest of the world. So they're buying a lot of whatever is available and it's making um, like places like here, they have to ship it up to us for wherever it's being grown. And uh, at the end of the line, the price just jumps immensely. I know people that pay 15 to $20 for 50 pound sacks of the same pellet, uh, 20, 18 or 20%. Uh, That's insane. Uh, I think it's interesting you came back to this, what you guys were talking about. I was actually foliar spraying uh, Kaido sand which is one of the only things to have uh, research behind it to help show less symptoms if a plant is infected. And it still seems like such a mad chaos. I just got a bunch of negative results back from MCR labs. I think it was three days ago. And mm. one plant is showing all the symptoms. I've had this cut for six mm. years. And like I was, I was mentally prepared. It's probably my favorite plant I've ever found from seed. I was already mentally prepared to do what I have to do, whether that was, you know, go through the costly and timely process to remediate it or just kill it. And it came back negative. 
So I'm going to test it a couple more times. I'm but I scared. Feel- I'd isolate it and test two, three times yeah. total because um, <laughs> it, more, the stuff, but- yeah. it can uh, it can mess with your head at that point because you – that's <laughs> yeah if you're using false if you're negatives, using false uh, negatives will kill you yeah false negatives will well they, they can ruin your day um uh, you're using kaidazan kaidazan's a, a very interesting you know uh very interesting you know it's, it's made from chitin right that is the uh shell uh, the exoskeleton of bugs and what it's doing is it you're essentially triggering the plant to uh, increase its immune response, right? You're, you're, you're giving the plant a, um, a bioactive compound that is going to make the plant think that it is in danger and therefore it's going to up and increase its, um, you know, immune response across the board. Uh, and Pelo Biosciences has a product called Continuum that uh, has the specific um, bacteria that can break down kaidazan into its smaller constituent parts that help trigger that response you should check it out if you have it's it's interesting stuff i played around with kaidazan for quite a while um and saw some significant responses in overall plant health uh terpene production cannabinoid production you know um it improved rooting during cloning like it's um uh, is an interesting interesting way to trick your plants into how, do, um, how does that how does that work different from insect frass same, same, same thing same thing right same. Yeah. lots difference yeah. you know i make yeah. a faa out of uh spot shrimp the heads make just a one to one, and I'm thinking that the kaidazan goes. I'm I'm wanting to feel good about it when I make the stuff, knowing that it's an FAA plus kaidazan boost, similar yeah. to like if you're using brass. But yeah, they certainly do respond to it. The immune the immune boost is right there. Change out my headphones. Yeah, it's crazy. yeah, that uh, that viroid got me a couple times. I just went through te- twenty tests last week, and every one came back, all but one, which was a Chem ninety one, and uh, they swear it flowers, and they've had it for a while. They said there was no problems with that plant, but the thing, I didn't ask the viroid load, meaning how long it has been infected, but the stems were so brittle, and it's wanting to bird nest, and those are some of the main signs that the plant's been infected for quite a while. Yeah. Mine were just snapping off. I think a water line hit it with no water. Exactly. Right when they're that brittle, even with silica that. input, you can't get them to quit being that brittle. So uh, that's one of the main things that I, whenever I'm testing, if I had a negative, re- negative report, I'll bend the bottom of that stem two inches from the soil line. And if that fucker snaps, it was meant to be. And it's probably infected, even if it's a negative report. But now they're saying, you know, test the root, don't test the vegetative material. A little bit of petioles from three different spots on the plant, but a, a wad of the upper I, one I inch took root. My though. sample from three stages of growth, everything you could want flower, petiole, root, stalk. I was I'm not- still real, uh, I'm leery of results because I've done about 140 tests now and, uh, Quite a few had when I had it when I had the infection. A lot of them came back, but then I'd get false negatives, and I'd go with the plant being good and healthy. And six months later, get it into flower, and that son of it had the thing, and it was just latent. And uh, if you have any uh, thrips, thrips tend to spread it like wildfire. So they're one of the hardest things I've ever battled. I put in uh, fuck five billion nematodes and gallons of sponosid A and D uh, and I've tried a lot of things and never been able to really eliminate thrips. I can get them down to 99% gone. But if you have an infestation, they will spread that uh, the viroid like mad. Root aphids, they're the worst. Never had them. And thank God not. I've never heard of anybody up here having them. Well, took me three months. I actually saved the plants. But oh, yeah, I, I was watching when you were having that battle. I, I went full nuclear. <laughs> I, I bought stuff that they couldn't send to Massachusetts. <laughs> Have to smuggle in your IPM. That's pretty bad. 
means it's not. The only time I've seen a a plant with thrips uh, get cured is bringing it to 12 to 20,000 feet elevation in the air. Now, I don't want to say how it got here or there. And I've asked pest experts before. (laughs) They say, no way. That couldn't have anything to do with it. I'm like, it's the only time I've seen it not stick with it. So it's like, bro science tells me you just get them up in a plane somehow and they pop. But the pest experts say I'm crazy. (laughs) Yeah, in a pressurized cabin, I think they're going to live. Because people bring up shit from California at the cups and stuff just left and right. So uh, That's what they said, too. But I was bringing mine from California to back back home. And they all died by the time they got here. I mean, I don't, I don't know what it was. I don't know how to quantify. It was the only time I've ever been able to escape them. That was when I was all gardens were down. I was moving. I took just the genetics with me. And they all came back clean. I thought it was going to be an instant battle. I, I don't know. It could just been luck or whatever it was. But yeah, they they might have found somebody else's plant tastier in the plane. <laughs> <laughs> oh, for sure. That's a trip. Yeah, the HLVD will get your head going, you know. I, I think I've been seeing it since 2010. I've been seeing what they tell now are symptoms of it since then. I never, We never had terms for it back then. and uh, They just called it dudding. Everybody would just call it dudding. Yeah, or a bad batch, or I didn't feed it right, or, you know. So what do you think about it going into seeds? They're saying at 10% rate going into seeds, but uh, I'm trying to get my friends at uh, LeafWorks to... They're trying to get a test down right now that they can have a, uh, a protocol to test seeds. And they've taken known infected mothers that have produced seeds and are trying to get it dialed down. I've sent in my own seeds I had curiosity about. And they and I've done that with Toomey also. And then they sent me back results as everything negative. So I don't even know. I've sent in 50 or 75 seeds. And uh, my friend at LeafWorks say it at that big of a batch, they're not going to be able to detect the thing. So uh I've heard you're gonna 50, have to get get it down to like twelve or fifteen uh, seeds. Once they uh, get this figured out, though, a lot of people are gonna feel a lot better. I guess either they're gonna feel better or worse about more negative, you know, results that are false. Yeah, I, I was hoping that our seeds would, you know, give us some security from it, but I was really um, bummed. I was really bummed to find out that it could be passed on in seed. It's up to 50%, the recent research. I think it averages out. It's 54%, I think, if it was a female that was infected. And let's say 46, I can't remember exactly if the male was the infected plant. It's, it passes a slightly less from the male. But it's a 50% shot if you have a high viral load. You know, it's uh, uh, They should be able to figure out a testing for seeds at that point if you got that high of a, a number my, of seeds. My local yeah. lab won't either. I've asked them to a couple times. It's MCR, which I love them, but... Uh, it just seems like they're not capable yet. I gave them a couple hundred seeds. I was like, just do whatever you got to do. Even if it costs me results, just try. Yeah, but if it's if it's RNA based, be short, it's not short, the there, there should be some good news. It's going to be in the embryo, seeds. right? I figure they'd have to yeah. wish them enough to get enough Gosh. fluid, yeah. like mill them almost. But, I, I mean, there's, it's got to be able to get enough liquid somehow. Yeah, when I, I talked to the guys at Toomey, um, they're saying that it can exist on the seed coat and it could potentially be passed that yeah. way. But they've I've also been told seen that the paracanthum in, like, is in the embryo. Dave, say it again. We lost you. Breaking up there. Paracanthum, the seed husk itself and uh you can bleach it off so maybe people i think it's in the embryo though because i've seen infected seeds yeah no it's it can get it can definitely get in the embryo uh 100 percent but i I would say i like sanitizing seeds nowadays oh yeah used to be a practice to not sanitize the outside of a seed but i don't mind the 10 percent bleach Just because there could be, there could be powder mildew spore. Who knows what's in it? Yeah, I've got to where I do ten percent bleach soak and uh, a UVC um, 
I'll, I'll throw my seeds under UVC for a little while before I germinate them just to try to make sure they're clear. How long you put them under there UVC? You go. Good idea. Um, yeah, I've got. Josh, how long? Oh, I do mine. I do mine for um, like 30 minutes for like one side and then I'll kind of roll them over 30 minutes per hour okay. total. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, I just bought some uh, UVC bulbs that they're like fluorescent bulbs that you screw into a regular socket. Um, they work. They work really well. Um, you think those are really yeah. UVC? I, I, I mean, UVC will destroy any nucleotide base. Yeah. You know, I've got a um, you know primer curing lamps for the auto body that are UVC and it's lab grade UVC. But I, I really didn't know that you could see it in a in a fluorescent type lamp. I didn't know that they had it. Well, well I, I don't know it. if you could see it, but you can definitely kill the viroid. If the viroid's present and you expose it to that UVC light, it'll break down that that nucleotide base. So during during COVID, I had nothing to do, so I made air boxes, and the air boxes are uh, have pretty good volume, and I know the the flow rate, and I have the UVC lights. So the air going into my tents is actually hit with the UVC before it goes into the tents. That's cool. Like that's, I said, it, I had nothing to do. Yeah, no, no, that's a great, um, that's funny. I actually was, um, I, I took over a facility about a year, uh, well, I guess about two years ago. Um, I worked there for a while and they had some pretty significant air quality problems. And one of the things that I did was we, we put UVC uh, on all the return registers for the HVAC. So right. any, anything that's coming in gets clean with UVC. Yeah. I think, you know, especially if you live in a, an environment where, you know, powdery mildew and, and things are uh, other pathogens are prone, be it botrytis or whatnot, um, or if you've had problems with those in the past, like it's not hard to rig up a UVC bulb into say take you've got your your carbon filter and then you can take on top of your carbon filter uh, if you've got that as an intake and you know pull an air through a carbon filter with a pre-filter then you go into a uvc and then maybe into a hepa and then into your room and then you can do the same on the exhaust so that it's you know you got clean air going in clean air coming out yeah i built a pro i think the boxes are three foot cubes and the bottom, and basically, I built the box so that I could use a hypoallergenic filter that's used in a, you know, an air system in a home. So I got a filter at the bottom to get out any of the loose stuff, which is a pretty fine filter because it's one, it's one of the high allergy filters. And then the top of the box, I got UVC, and then my fan that actually provides air to the tent comes from that box. So I figured. Yeah, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna venture into building a. a uvc intake box bob you yeah i had never even considered it but uh luann Lu luann plywood a couple of couple of screw nails and it's you know you can buy the the uvc double bulbs online they're pretty cheap yeah i've got i've got uh extra bulbs i don't use the uh my body shop lamps anymore so they're like 400 watt uh pretty industrial yeah, I I have a Mac. I have two boxes for that. That one feeds two tents, one feeds another, and then I leave one fan, one tent for the uh, for the masses. I have uh, no humidity control and no clean air, so this way I can find out which ones are more prone to getting stuff than other stuff. Well, this year has been a super shitty rain year, just like you guys. Uh, P a PM year for sure up here, and we had like the wettest, windiest coldest june on record since 1950 and then overall the wettest summer i think it might come up to the wettest summer so we uh we're battling anything and everything humidity is just shit everybody's cranking their dehumidifiers and uh cleaning the air as best you can a lot of ozone scrubbing fighting the battle uh, yeah for, but yeah you guys got hammered i know people in maine that just uh, the, the, whatever that you guys were talking about sephorium or whatever the hell they got hit with that and then they got hit with the weather and uh they're they're fighting a lot over there doesn't look fun 
Uh, was that the name of that stuff you said that was that, that attacks the uh, the fan leaves of the cannabis plant? Yeah, Josh, you're on you're on mute, but it's uh, Septoria, I think, is what it is. Yeah, Septoria. Yeah, Septoria. yeah first time I'd ever seen it. We haven't had it up here, but I don't, wouldn't doubt it. It's on its way. Well, I've seen it in the town I live in, so it's here. I just yeah, I've seen the, it on tomato plants and greenhouses pretty commonly, but I've never seen it jump to cannabis. But we don't grow a lot out up here. Not a lot outdoor. Twenty hours sunlight's only good for veg. <laughs> or revegging, really great for revegging, like free reveg system, with with exposure um, testing. So it's a pretty good system there. Yeah, it primarily only spreads from. It's a soil based, um, you know, it's a soil based uh, a fungus. So it primarily spreads um, through rain falling on freshly tilled soil, or if somebody goes along with a, you know, a weed whacker or a lawnmower or whatever and uh, blows that debris and dust up onto the plant, it can get infected. So, yeah, I had never heard of the fusarium until just a couple of years ago when my friends got hit with that, too. So uh, there's there's a lot of uh, things that are just being readily popping up fungus wise and spreading like crazy. A question for you guys up top, because I'm assuming you've been able to look at plants for decades longer than me. How long do you guys think it's been since the viroid jumped from hops or other things like it? And is there anything that's that noticeable that's different from plants from back then? Trying to not look at just the genetics because they were so much less bottlenecked back then, but... I don't know how to really ask what I'm asking, but like, cause it seems like you guys are concerned in the, the community is all over the place, whether they think the viroid is a total joke or if they think it's something that they stay up at night about because they're nervous about it. Curious to hear, hear what your guys' perspective is like about things like that. Cause we're talking about septoria of Assyrium, like all these things that pop up throughout the years, you know? It's definitely not a joke. Like I've, I've, I've worked some of the largest commercial facilities in the country and I've seen what it can do inside of a commercial facility. And like the people are like, Oh, HLV is like, this is not a joke. And then what we heard just a minute ago that it might be hopping from hops and cannabis into our food production and game grain production. Like this has potential. If, if this is the case, this has potential implications that are far reaching and will have worldwide worldwide, worldwide like economic impacts that could cause massive global food shortages to where I'm like, when we're done here, I'm going to go check my supply of like dry powdered milk and shit. To make well, they sure said I it's in the grape stuff. industry. They said it spread to the grape industry. So it'll be, it, uh, it could be just like any of the citrus funguses that have wiped out the citrus industry, the green fruit disease, any of them things, you know, it'll knock out. 60% of production on some of those things. Uh, and I think 15 years ago is about the first time I've considered it could have jumped. It about wiped out the Washington state's hop industry down to about 20%. It wiped about 80% of it out about 12 or 15 years ago. So I am imagine that's when it pretty much hit the road and took off on other, uh, on other cultivars. That's interesting because I think I've seen it since about 2010 myself. So that would kind of line up with that. It's I'm so far reached, uh, the, you know, it'd be it hard for me to correlate only because I know people that live near. Uh, some, so it's harder for me to say. I think that's a, a valuable piece of data, though, if that's uh, one of the years that the hops crop was so infected and affected, that makes sense that that's when you know, it would have started moving around to me, you know, bro science. It's all how you interpret the data. Bro. That makes sense yeah. to me. I think that I am going to end up checking out here because my, uh, my iPad that I'm using is down to about one or 2% power and I'm yeah, not I'm near a power source. I'm going to run also. So this thing's going to, it's going to voluntarily shut me off. <laughs> well, I appreciate you greatly for all the, uh, the insights and the conversation. It was a privilege and a pleasure. Uh, it's, it's great to spread any knowledge that we can spread and share information between each other. I appreciate every one of you, and uh, I got quite a bit out of uh, Josh. I appreciate your help on uh, anything you've told me. Oh, yeah, I know you've got here. some knowledge under your belt that I do not have. So, 
Dave, as always, Josh, it's a pleasure meeting you. This was fun. This is, uh, I love yeah. doing this stuff. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Uh, I look up to you guys a lot. Um, I, I appreciate any, any time I have to, uh, um, you know, to learn and, and to, uh, to hear and share stories and things. So I've enjoyed it immensely. It's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah, absolutely. Tra Travis, thank you. Yeah, I appreciate it, Travis. Absolutely. Yeah, thank if you, you guys very are much. interested, we'll keep the conversations going, you know. Hopefully we'll get some guests going in and out, and whenever we can sync up schedules, shoot the shit, and talk Canna. I love it. Love yeah, hearing what you guys have. Back. Yeah. All right. Appreciate it, man. You guys have a good night. All right. You too. Later, Bob.